So I'm now looking for questions, if anybody's got any questions in the audience. Um, so Kate, first up. Oh, you have, you have to, but the people behind really struggle to hear, so if we can get the mic over. And if you could mention who you're asking the question of. Yeah, I'll, I'll do that. Thank you very much for really fabulous presentations from all different perspectives and music to my ears, as, as Patrick knows. Um, Anthony, yes. I'd probably direct the question to you because I, I just think it's fabulous what you guys are doing. Um, it's really wonderful that you're taking all those lessons that were outlined by Alona and, and um, Fiona and Michael all the way through. I suppose the one thing that I wonder, and maybe it's, you know, you guys are really out there at the forefront, so all power to you. What's the next step in terms of, yes, the report you're hoping is going to be released soon. Has the Alliance got a plan for how you actually go about working with the public to get that known about and accepted to develop the transparency and legitimacy that that um, that's being talked about? Um, well, formally, no. However, that whole fish and go aura that we have involves the ENGOs. Now, one thing I've learned about ENGOs is that they need to get results in order to get their funding. Okay, so we believe that we're a big candidate to get a result here. So very early on in the piece, with Patrick as a, as a bit of a mentor and a guide, we, we went to the ENGOs and we said, you know, we're probably going to have the ability to sign some form of a conservation agreement here because we feel that we're going to be able to operate in a section of the fishery that's going to give us some of this um, transparency type literature, the documents you can put out for... To the, to the public, so I think it's more about being able to be, being able to get your industry into a position where you tick the boxes to be able to provide that transparency before you actually come up with a formal plan to get, out, get it out to the public and the community. Otherwise, we're gonna be disjointed in the way we go about that. So that conservation agreement, um, to me, all of a sudden represented significant value because not only did I have Michael all of a sudden want to know me, but you know, the other NGOs who are competing for that for that funding from from the donor, from the donators of around the world are saying we'd like to have that we'd like to have that conservation agreement with you, or we'd like to have that conservation agreement with you. So I can now sit back and instead of having the darts thrown at me, I can sort of say, well, here's the board, who's going to score the best? Okay, so I could sort of say, well, I'm I'm likely to achieve something with Michael, but I'm not likely to achieve something with, say, AMCS, for example. Uh, because they, they, their rules might be too stringent. So if we can get ourselves into a position where we're likely to achieve this um, environmental tick that we might get through um, getting the MSC certification, then I'm likely to achieve a, some form of a, uh, a tick on putting a conservation agreement together with someone like WWF. That will give us the transparency to be able to go to the public and say, here we are, this is what we've achieved. So there's still the plan to go to the public once you've got that tick. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I, I no, I, I suppose that's what I was really it. seeing, asking the question of whether you see this as a long-term journey or whether it's just a short-term, but you, you've answered that, so Kate, it's great. behind you. Sorry, one. And if you just say who you are. I, I think you <laughs> might be good at that one. <laughs> oh. Everyone looked at me. What just happened? <laughs> <laughs> Am I the rogue? <laughs> <laughs> I'll have a go at those questions. I think in uh, uh, starting with the end one and then turning to the to the, to the first one. So I can't remember the middle one, but it's okay. Um, I think. If you have social license, the rogues don't matter. There's rogues in any industry, in any sector, and I think if a, orga if a sector or an organization has a social license and it's seen to be dealing with those rogues effectively, then those outliers, those people who are seen to be having bad behaviors or not conforming to uh, expectations matter less. I think when you're missing that social license, though, 
the, uh, that rogue element becomes the ones that keeps you from getting that social license back. So I think once you have it, and you're seen as a sector to be controlling that social license, I think it's uh, much more, um, it matters less because you're seen to be controlling it. To the, uh, I think on the question, how do you know when you have social license, I think it's very simply when anyone just stops dumping and tipping everything all over you every day. Uh, I think you can propose things like the super trawler coming to Australia and have a civilized debate about it. It doesn't necessarily mean you'll have the super trawler turning up on Australian shores, but you may not have a campaign running against you because there are avenues and opportunities to have that discussion inside the tent rather than people creating a, an environment of a campaign or a special interest group against you. So I think it's not so much that you're, uh, when, you have a, when you have a social license to operate, it's because life becomes a lot easier for you. You're fighting fewer um, battles and having more discussions. And it doesn't necessarily mean you're gonna get everything, you are gonna have a super trawler arrive in Australia, but it means the debate around that would be less, uh, what's the word, ver uh, virulent toxic. or? Uh, yeah, toxic, uh, or for everybody involved, and actually increasingly potentially damaged relationships across the board. And so I think, uh, and, and as I can see, I think uh, it just means red list tape for the industry to operate. I look around the world, and I look at those fisheries that have a social license to operate, and they have a relatively peaceful life. They go out there and make money, and they do it with the support of communities, and the regulators tend to be quite hands-off because they're seen to be exceeding the regulations, exceeding the, um, the, the legal requirements, and they're accepted and as part of the community and allowed to operate within the bounds that that social license gives them to operate. You see that in some Australian fisheries, but you, in a great many Australian fisheries, that's absent at the moment, which means they don't have that freedom or that, that ability to operate and wake up and breathe easy in the morning knowing that their livelihoods are secure. Graham. Graham Turk, Sydney Fish Market. Um, <clears throat> much easier question than Jim's. Um, Anthony, uh, have you got any information on the cost of production um, of, of the line court versus the gill net? Yes, we do, Graham. It's, um, there is an economic element to the, to the project itself. Um, again, we have, that'll be released with, with the report, but I can tell you that it is more expensive to go hook fishing than it is to go gillnet fishing. So, you know, question or hard decisions are going to have to be made about, you know, for a fisherman, whether or not he's going to be able to invest the money in order to be able to maintain the kind of revenues he was having before. Um, and that then leads to a subset of questions, which is probably the role for the loaners team and, and, the, and the managers that we have here, the good managers that will sort of say, well, you know, to how far can we allow the industry to make best use of current technologies that are available to sort of re reduce that, those costs through better efficiencies. Uh, Brad, that way? That way. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Brad. That's a hard question. <laughs> I think it's, um, gosh, you know, I think it's cooperate, cooperate with each other. Do you know? I think that's, that's the lesson. It's cooperation, it's transparency, it's don't be afraid of telling your story because the story's a good one. Yeah. Yeah, it's cooperation, cooperating with each other and, and, and transparency. Don't be afraid. Hmm. So is that a cooperation with the industry? Yeah, absolutely. Question down here. <laughs> You're all very helpful with that microphone. Just make sure it's on there. Yeah. You there? Yep. Yeah. Um, Craig Perkins from the Regional Development Australia Tasmania Committee. Uh, and my question, I guess, is to Fiona and Michael, and it sort of leads on from that question about the industry. And I think 
uh, as an observer, one of the things the Tasmanian salmon industry has done well, we've got three main players and they've developed the industry together, particularly getting licenses to develop farms in Macquarie Harbour, which is you know, right on the edge of beautiful World Heritage area. Um, my question is, I guess, is to, um, to both Fiona and Michael, is how important has that working together been and how important, particularly to Michael in terms of the social licence, you're giving it to one company and not the other two because they haven't gone down that path, but I would suspect that if one of those companies, not suggesting they would, went down the road path, mm. does that change the game plan at all? Um, so I suppose, firstly, it's Tassau that has a partnership with WWF. Um, the development plan for Macquarie Harbour was put forth with two other uh, large aquaculture companies that operate in Tasmania, um, and they don't have a partnership with WWF. So, so um, I mean, in some ways, the WWF partnership is separate from that expansion in Macquarie Harbour. Yeah. Works. Um, the, um, in terms of though, and while the, the, the separation is there, I guess from WWF's point of view, and I guess, um, does that, I mean, do you, do you look at the way the industry works generally, or do you say, well, here's just one company that's doing really well and provide that in isolation? If, if one of them was to perform poorly from an environmental point of view, would that change the way you as an NGO approach the way you assess one company? Yeah, the answer is yes. I mean, we chose, we, we, we chose to work in aquaculture for a number of reasons. It's a growing sector in the Australian economy, whether it be in salmon or whether it be in barramundi and other, in other areas. So we know it's an important growing area and it's an important place for us to be to encourage best practices in the aquaculture sector as a whole. And Tassel, were, you couldn't want a better partner to start out on that journey. But we do assess the overall uh, sector. And you're right, if there were too many uh, uh, rogue players in the sector, we would probably approach it a different way. We probably work through one of our retail uh, partners to put pressure on that sector to perform, to increase the performance through the supply chain, and then identify winning champions within that sector and begin to work with them closely. So you wouldn't abandon it, you would take a different tactic rather than partnering directly. But I think the, uh, the issue, I think, is that in part, I think WF, when we associate with a company, we do, we do help confer a social license to that, to that operation. And in doing so, we hope the other um, companies in that industry will recognise that and then be encouraged to perform at similar levels as our partner organisation. So it very much is hoping to bring those others, others along. And frankly, if another company didn't um, reach those same levels, then it would be relatively easy, not for us, but for other NGOs perhaps, to target them rather than targeting the industry as a whole to show that their performance is not acceptable to ta Tasmanian communities. Last question, Graham, and then we'd wrap um, up. Sorry, Michael, the, the corollary, the, uh, this is not a question, probably a yeah. statement, so you might it's have a, another this question. This is a rhetorical but, um, <laughs> <laughs> The corollary of that's probably also true. You described yourselves as being in, in the middle, and that's probably why you are getting engagement, whereas I think there are some NGOs that are right in the extremes, and they're not getting engagement, and, and we don't really know what to do with them, to be honest. But you, you are getting it because you are in the middle. They've got rogues too, Graham. <laughs> They've got rogues as well. So I think I'd, I would like to wrap up. Just a, a couple of uh, points, and uh, can I thank the four speakers for giving me copious opportunities to write notes. Um, Michael's comments that, uh, you know, um, if we don't do it right, we'll just be regulated and governed to the point where um, if you're a fisheries uh, minister, uh, you'll be driven insane by the number of legislations and regulations you'll need for fisheries. Uh, the alternative path is that we have to engage and we have to develop a, a, a new role, a new model. Um, I think clearly that from the case studies that we've had from both Fiona and from uh, Anthony, it's quite clear that that engagement means the industry has to actually change its attitude to how it works with people. I know Michael's had a few go at me over the years saying, why weren't we invited, why weren't we invited? Um, we in the fishing industry tend to have a pretty insular way we deal with people. Um, we like to do our things our way, we've always done it that way. There is a certain change of behaviour, whether that's management, research, the industry and how we work with the NGOs. We have to stop seeing it as being us versus them, but how do we actually partner? That is a big change for an industry that's worked the way it has for, for many decades. Um, I think today you saw a couple of case studies of how it can happen. Um, it's really important that we reflect on the fact that it's uh, 
Um, and again, Fiona gave us a little insight, and I suspect her marketing company wasn't that happy for her to say it, but it's actually what you do, not what you say, that's important. Um, and if you don't back it up with uh, realistic um, performance reporting on what you're doing, um, whatever you say will fall over. And, uh, and I thank the speakers today to giving us plenty of evidence that there is an opportunity to, to change and to actually get um, a better community expectation around trust um, for our industry. So I'd like to thank you to get you to thank the four speakers. And can I just also just thank uh, uh, ABARES and the Department of Agriculture, Fisheries and Forestry again for helping us put on today. We really appreciate their support for doing that. So uh, thank you very much to them as well. And thank you for your attendance. <laughs>